Good evening and welcome to the TNT pre-show for season three, episode four. This is your opportunity to check your audio and check your video. Maybe pour yourself a glass of wine or a cup of tea. (laughs) And maybe have some strawberries with whipped cream. Uh, COVID-19 uh, would seem to be receding, but I would advise everyone to stay safe and be nice. So now we're going to go to a full screen, Justine, and for our shop commercial. And we have two wonderful publications. The first is very relevant to this evening, uh, Sunny Asu's A Selective History, a wonderful full illustrated look at Sunny Asu's career to date. And then also we have our excellent Jean-Paul Riopel publication from the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts that is accompanying the Jean-Paul Riopel exhibition, Call of Northern Landscapes and Indigenous Cultures. I would encourage everyone to consider taking out a membership at the museum Uh, $75 for an individual membership and $100 for a dual membership. And all the items in the shop can be found at shop.odaneartmuseum.com. The museum is currently open Thursday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And uh, we're in the final weeks of the Riapel exhibition. And I would encourage everyone to come up and witness what has been one of the most important special exhibitions in the museum's five-year history. Another um, treat, uh, we've recently uh, revised the permanent collection galleries. In fact, the room that I'm sitting in features uh, three new uh, uh, positioning of works here, uh, one of which we'll be talking about tonight. And in the earlier galleries, we we do have other uh, contemporary works that have been recently added to the collection. So always lots to see and do at the Odane Art Museum. Okay, I can see that we're almost ready to go. And tonight, we'll see a high watermark in season three in terms of our uh, registered Yes, and soon we're ready to go in 25 seconds. Just the bluebird day here in Whistler. The sun was out, it's minus three, and we've got lots of happy skiers and snowboarders all over the mountains and trails. <laughs> so we've got 10 seconds to go, and we're almost into episode four. Three, two, one. Here we go. Welcome to Tuesday Night Talk, Season 3, Episode 4. Uh, the Omicron variant is still sweeping the nation, so as said in the pre-show, stay safe and be nice. Tonight, we're in the last room of the museum's permanent collection by the flashlights glow here in Whistler, British Columbia, on the shared territories of the Squamish and Lillawat Nation. We have over 400 people registered for tonight's program, so we're elated that this program continues to attract such a wide audience. Tonight, we're gonna discuss the installation-based piece just behind me, and it's entitled Silence the Hidden from 2011. And the maker of this piece is live from his studio on the Liquilta territories on Vancouver Island. Good evening, Sonny Asu. Hey, Curtis. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. All right. Nice to see you, too. Okay. So before we uh, begin the discussion on this piece behind me, there are a number of works that predate uh, Hidden, and perhaps we'll jump right into the discussion with this first breakfast series from 2006. Can you 
give us some background on what inspired you uh, to create this series of cereal boxes, Sonny. Yeah, well, this uh, work, like you said, comes from 2006. And um, the, this work and the next two slides that are following it all come from uh, my first solo exhibit in Vancouver at the former Belkin Satellite Gallery called um, Sunny Asu, as defined by the Indian Act. And um, this work from that era, along with a lot of my works back then, um, was made um, with a lot of humor involved in it. And I think uh, for a lot of my work back then, I like to come up with an idea that would kind of make me chuckle or make me laugh and then bring a lot of seriousness, seriousness into it. Um, and I felt that in doing that, uh, you know, when I approached these issues around indigeneity, um, not only in what is now known as British Columbia and what is now known as Canada, um, you know, if you bring it into with a sensitive humor, I always felt that people will be more willing to accept these heavier conversations um, that I that I that was inherent to a lot of the work uh, that I was making and that I still do make. Um, for me, um, this work uh, was just a way to talk about specific issues. Um, that were that are relevant to indigenous peoples um, across what is now known as North America, um, and with a lot of the indigenous issues that are coming up um, recently over the past couple of years, I think this work uh, becomes uh, uh, even more poignant uh, today. Yes, um, and this work was also exhibited here at the Odain Art Museum as uh, an extension of the Pop Art Show, Pop Art mm -hmm. in Canada. Can you talk about just a little bit about the play on words, uh, you know, treaty flakes and, and those kind of references and how language plays into a piece like this? Yeah, well, Treaty Flake specifically uh, was a piece um, that was inspired by um, my Treaty Nation. Um, back in 2006, we had um, five member nations that had come together, um, collectively known as the Liquata peoples with the Comox, um, that were fighting for um, their treaty and their sovereignty. And it's still a process that's been going on um, for 20, 25 years now. Um, and I just wanted to bring a little bit of history to um, the viewing public to let people know that there is currently in British Columbia uh, on an ongoing treaty process. Uh, but I also wanted to tackle stereotypes uh, through this through this work, um, specifically with the piece called Lucky Beads, um, where it was addressing um, the uh, assumption or the story that um, the island of Manhattan was was sold for a handful of, of shiny beads. Um, so if you take if you take a closer look at this work, um, you'll be able to see the side panels um, with some of the political implications and meanings behind them. Um, some of them are just strictly humorous, like Bannock Pops. Um, Kwakwakiwak is uh, the, the nation, the Liquata peoples are part of the Kwakwakiwak uh, nation. So I, I consider myself a Kwakwakiwak artist as well. Um, so that's just a play on words there. Uh, and when you look at Salmon Crisp, for example, uh, Potlatch, you know, that's a very important uh, ceremonial practice to a lot of Northwest Coast uh, peoples. And so that was just another play on words uh, there. Excellent. And this piece is related to the next work we'll look at called Coke uh, Salish. And again, you're playing with consumer culture and logos. Mm -hmm. uh, can you get behind this work for our viewers? Yeah, so this work, I came up with the idea for this work in 2003 when Vancouver uh, was awarded the 2010 Winter Games. And what I found interesting about that was that the whole um, conversation around that and the advertising around it and uh, was all about how the world would be coming to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And at the time, there wasn't really much of an Indigenous presence uh, within these conversations around the Olympics uh, until later. Um, so what I wanted to do is I just wanted to let people know that they were coming to unseceded um, Coast and Lillouette peoples as well. Uh, and this work was uh, what I called from my Urban Totem series, which was looking at how um, we are informed by consumerism, much like the breakfast series as well. 
where we are bombarded uh, on a daily basis by advertising um, and these advertisings and this iconography becomes part of our uh, personal lineages. And the choice of uh, placing this piece in somewhat of a light box, is that also a bit of a nod to the Vancouver conceptualism and the predominance of light boxes in Vancouver art? No, not really. It was more so, that's that's a good one though. I like that. Um, but it was more so to do with the the advertising itself. Um, I was just kind of seeing these things as just as light boxes, something that would be advertised on the side of a, uh, of a convenience store. And the, the final work in these interrelated pieces from 2006, which is uh, part of the collection here at the Odean Art Museum, and it's called Death Blanket. Can you mm -hmm. discuss obviously the, the blanket reference and then the image that's embedded in this blanket? Yeah, so this is a uh, Hudson's Bay blanket um, that I'd found, uh, that I purchased off of eBay. Um, and it's based on um, uh, Kwakwakiwak regalia, where we would wear um, button blankets that would have our, our clan or our crest, our family crest on the back of it um, with these elaborate patterns of buttons uh, all over the blankets themselves. So this is what the, the patterning uh, of the blanket or the buttons are on there. Um, but I put the skull on there and called it the death blanket um, because in the early history of Canada and colonization of not only Canada, but North America, Hudson's Bay blankets and these trade blankets uh, were used to spread um, smallpox and tuberculosis amongst the first people. Um, and it was a very uh, uh, sad part of, of our collective history that we don't know much about. And I learned um, a lot of, uh, of these uh, a lot of this, um, these conversations uh, when I was going to school at uh, Emily Carr, uh, a lot of uh, conversations that were passed down from uh, instructors, First Nations instructors and oral histories. So I just really wanted to bring this out there um, to let people know that this is part of our history. Uh, because the Hudson's Bay blanket itself is is so iconic, it, it almost it almost screams uh, Canada when you see these things. Um, and I just wanted people to be aware that there is a dark history um, um, embedded into this into this object. In terms of, you, you seem to use a, a, a very interesting range of materials that are embedded with meaning. Uh, you know, how did you begin to sort of choose these types of materials, whether it's light boxes or, or, or blankets or even cereal boxes? Yeah, I mean, for the cereal box and the uh, the light box, those were digital based works, and I do a lot of computer based uh, work as well. Um, but they usually kind of turn into analog uh, products or uh, artworks. Um, and you know, I just think the exploration of materials um, has become such an aside from the digital based works has become such an important part of my practice. Um, that it yeah it's just it's just something that i've that i've always kind of reached for and i've been very curious and um and wanted to honor how i i, I use I use and choose these materials to tell to tell the story okay thank you so now the next series of works are all related and, and lead up to the piece behind me mm -hmm. uh this piece is entitled silence number one from 2010 and can you kind of share with our viewers the idea of the format behind this work and, and how you've presented them? Yeah, so this is actually related to the, the previous work, The Death Blanket, as well. Um, what I did with these works is I was really starting to explore um, more abstract notions within uh, my paintings and within my works um, from around that era, so 2010, 2008, around there. I started to get more conscious of abstraction um, in my works, um, and I wanted to, I wanted to kind of embed that uh, that abstraction with something more meaningful. Um, so I kind of took the idea of the Hudson's Bay blankets, um, looking at the color of, of the kind of creamy color of the Hudson's of some of the Hudson's Bay blankets, and kind of pairing that with the, the uh, skin tone of the animal hide drums. And uh, with this one, um, it was actually a really interesting one. That, to paint uh, just because I used uh, a very textured uh, paint uh, for the red stripes where I wanted to kind of give it that kind of 
fluffy wooly look um, but it feels a little bit more like uh, it's a pumice a pumice gel um, that's in there and for the stacking of them I wanted to reference how Hudson's Bay blankets as as much as they are uh, a symbol of uh, Canadiana and they have such a dark history to them they were referenced uh, in potlatch culture and potlatch society as something that was highly prized um, to be given away um, the the iconic uh, four stripe blanket like the death blanket itself with the four color stripes on it um, those ones are, are are known as chief's blankets through a lot of potlatching um, societies and they are given to um, higher ranking officials or higher ranking members of the potlatch society. Um, so I just, so again, um, I wanted to reference that, that stacking of those blankets and how they were giving away, given away at the potlatches, but also referencing the, um, the hidden history um, that is in, embedded into these, these objects. And, and the title of this piece, Silence, I mean, I'm assuming the assess suggestion here is that these drums are no longer making the sound that they were intended for. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So the end, they're, 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 they have no sound that is being played from them. And they just, there's also a silencing that was happening um, through the, the use of the blankets to spread those, those, those diseases amongst the first people and the genocide that has been practiced by um, the Canadian governments towards the indigenous peoples. Okay, now we'll move to silenced numbers two and three, which take a similar drum form, but have a, a very uh, different uh, visual element and, and color coordination. Yeah, so I did, for these ones, I wanted to touch on um, just the different color colors that were used in the Hudson's Bay blankets themselves. Um, during uh, potlatch giveaways, uh, the most recognizable ones other than the chief blankets that you would see would just be like the gray 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 base blankets with the, the darker gray stripe on it so that's what the one on the the left represents um, but i just put a bit of, of gold colored paint in there just to kind of give it a bit more of, of a pop and then the red one as well there's an iconic kind of red uh hudson's bay blanket that is out there with that kind of black stripe as well um and i was very conscious about how i painted these shapes so if you're actually to kind of with the ones that have the the tiered um, the tiered stacks, so the different shapes as they go up higher. If you were to pull one up the top, you can kind of see the pattern uh, follow uh, the 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 pattern as it goes down on the drums themselves. Um, and so I was also very conscious of using the points on the blanket. So if you look at a Hudson's Bay blanket, you'll see the you know anywhere from like one point to four points on there. And even modern ones have higher up to six or eight, I think. Um, back in the day during the trade era, um, a, a point on a on a blanket was equal to one fur. So if you show up with four furs, you can get a four point blanket. Uh, if you show up with and it also it's also the quality of the pelts that you'd be bringing in as a trader. Um, so if you show up with, you know, four, four fur pelts, but they're not as strong quality, you might get a three point blanket or a three and a half point blanket or, or so on. And then in terms of the painted elements, you know, you begin to manipulate um, ovoids and the form line. Can you discuss your, you know, your entry into that uh, graphic element? Yeah, and I think with these ones, like I mentioned earlier about the abstraction uh, of my work and the formality of it, um, I was just really trying to play on those elements uh, with breaking out um, the specific shapes from the Northwest Coast and putting them on the surfaces of these drums. Because um, normally when you see uh, artwork from the Northwest Coast, it has a very um, stylized element to it. You know, you see the elements of the ovoids and the A shapes and the U shapes coming together to form a story of a raven or a bear or an eagle or whatever it might be. Um, but for me, I wanted to break apart those elements and just focus purely on the shapes themselves and the compositions of just playing with abstraction within them. Okay, next we're going to move to an image of your solo show at the Equinox Gallery in Vancouver in 2010. Mm -hmm. So can you discuss how you positioned these drum uh, constructions off against, uh, again, your use of the Hudson's Bay blanket? Yeah, so this, again, was from, two, from 2010. So this is when the Olympics were um, 
in Vancouver or coming to Vancouver. It was in May. I can't remember when the Olympics finally showed up to Vancouver. Um, but this is my um, my solo at the Equinox Gallery. Um, and I just kind of put these these drums uh, stacked up in the corner again to reference that that stacking uh, for the potlatch themselves. Um, but I wanted to take the Hudson's Bay blankets and make them into the shape of sports pennants. Um, just to kind of uh, talk about that notion of uh, are, are challenging the pride that people have um, in their Canadian identities. Um, and I think a lot of that is rooted in not knowing uh, the true history of this place and how these blankets and how um, the Indigenous peoples have been subjugated for the entirety of Canada's history. Um, so for me, it was kind of like almost like an, you, you see a sports pen and, it, and it's cheering, right? But it, for me, it was almost like an anti-cheer to make them to make them this way. And can you maybe discuss some of, you know, how you have been able to uh, discover for yourself these kinds of histories in Canada that, as you say, have been either silenced or are not commonly known? Yeah, for me, you know, I learned... Yeah, I'm, I'm 46. Uh, you know, I went to, I was in high school in the nineties. Um, I, you know, going to, to elementary school in the eighties and stuff. I never learned uh, anything uh, about indigenous peoples other than something that was in the past tense. Uh, and it wasn't until I started going to Emily Carr in uh, 1999 and 2000 um, when I started learning more about the history uh, of this place, um, studying with people like Dana Claxton and learning um, uh, history about Indigenous peoples from her through her work and the work that she was showing of other peoples and being able to bring those conversations back to someone like my grandmother uh, back when she was alive and being able to ask her these questions, you know, around the residential schools or the potlatch ban, you know, you know, did, you know, I asked my grandmother specifically, did you go to a residential school? She went to a day school, um, but finding out that her mother went to a residential school. Um, you know, finding out that there was the potlatch ban in Canada, which is a piece we're going to talk about in a little bit, um, you know, was was very interesting. So it, it, it's interesting how uh, a lot of um, Indigenous culture is oral based and passed down, even the 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 shitty stuff that has happened to Indigenous peoples um, across this place called Canada. Um, you know, these stories still live and persist, and it's. It, it almost feels like only now um, that we're starting to recognize um, oral history and oral traditions as being something as relevant as um, scholarly studies. So that's all to say okay. really is that's how I learned all that stuff. And I was able to bring that back to my community and, and find out more. Okay. And now we'll move to uh, a work that is very closely associated with the piece in our collection. This is Silence the Burning from 2011. And Again, you've uh, increased the number of drums. You, know, you have a different sort of color sequencing and it's, it's a much larger installation. Yeah, so this is Silence the Burning uh, from 2011, which is the companion piece to Silence the Hidden, which is behind you. Um, this one was a specific uh, reference to a story that I was told um, by one of my uncles about my great-great-grandfather, Chief Billy Asu. And uh, during the potlatch ban uh, in Canada, which lasted from 1884 to 1951, it was illegal for any Indigenous person um, to practice their cultural beliefs, to study their language, to, um, to sing their songs, to practice ceremony. Um, and if you were caught, um, that meant that you would have to um, um, either pay a fine or you would go to jail. This story is specific to my to my great grandfather, so Chief Billy Asu. Um, he was having a potlatch in the early 1900s, and he was approached by an Indian agent who um, told him that he found out that he was going to be potlatching, and he was reminded that it was illegal. And he gave my grandfather an ultimatum. He said that you can either um, continue with your potlatch, um, and you. Uh, I can come and I could bust it and I could take all this stuff from you, all your regalia from you, or you could surrender your regalia to me now and uh, no harm, no foul, we'll call it a day. Um, and so 
what my grandfather did, my great grandfather did, was he recognized that a lot of this work, that a lot of his regalia um, that he had been collecting for years for his ceremonial purposes uh, would be taken from him or would be stolen or would be sold off to museums um, across the world. Um, and what he recognizes, he didn't want to have that. And he would rather have his work, his regalia go back to the ancestors. So he dragged all his potlatch regalia um, down to the beach and burnt it. Um, and so this is what this piece references. So there's 67 um, uh, animal hide drums painted with acrylic paint um, stacked up. And the 67 is in reference to the potlatch ban, which I mentioned earlier, 1884 to 1951. For, so 67 drums. And the red line represents the fire um, that, that swept through um, all of the regalia. Um, you know, and, you know, when I, when I first learned about this story and I would tell this story to people who would view this work or when I'd be giving an artist talk, um, I always felt a bit sad uh, about, you know, knowing that he destroyed these works. But what I've come to recognize through living back home here in the community is that, you know, we commonly burn things to send them back to the ancestors. So I just know that that regalia is now in a better place. Very fascinating personal history behind this. And then finally, um, Silence the Hidden, which as I mentioned is part of our collection that came courtesy of Michael Ordain and Yoshi Karasawa. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, again, a much subtler colors and a different kind of stacking in a corner position? Um, you know, talk about the history of this piece. Yeah, so like I said, this is the, the companion piece to Silence the Burning, uh, and it's called Silence the Hidden. <clears throat> and again, it's in reference to the 67 years of the potlatch band, so 67 um, animal hide drums uh, stacked up uh, in the corner. Um, I wanted it to be in the corner because I kind of felt um, that you know, as indigenous peoples, we're always kind of backed into the corner and we're always going to have to fight our way out of it. Um, and uh, it's painted in this kind of tone on tone um, color palettes uh, that again is in reference to the Hudson's Bay blanket. So if you take a look at one of the drums here, um, uh, you know, on the screen, you can kind of see that kind of negative space of the skin, which is the band um, of the Hudson's Bay blanket with the kind of abstract placements of the Northwest Coast formline elements, the ovoids, S shapes, U shapes, et cetera. Um, and I call it the hidden and I use it the tone on tone um, just to kind of um, reiterate the fact that a lot of history um, that Indigenous history in Canada is is unknown and un, and not taught, um, especially back, like I said, well, like I mentioned when I was going to school. Now it's a little bit different. Uh, you know, I, I get to see my children learn about the history um, of the Indian Act and the residential schools and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think we've we've come a little bit farther than when I was going to the public school system. Um, but there still is a lot of misinformation um, out there around indigenous issues, and a lot of the issues are are hidden from the public. And um, and it, I always find it kind of interesting because that that kind of when we take a look at indigeneity in Canada and the issues we face as indigenous peoples and you know the comment section on places like Facebook and CBC and all kinds of you can see the hate and the vitriol. Um, I think that really comes a lot, some of it comes from a misunderstanding of, of who the indigenous peoples are and you know where we come from and what we're all about. Very good, thank you so much. So uh, as we do every week, we're gonna move to the uh, Q&A part of TNT, and we're fortunate that we had a number of really uh, fascinating questions that I'll pose to you now, Sunny. Uh, Jerry from New Westminster asks, where do you typically find yourself making art? Uh, well, here in my studio, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I, you know, I, I live in a very beautiful part of the province. Um, I live in my traditional territory. We, we've been here with my family now for um, almost five or six years. Uh, you know, I get to be able to uh, work uh, and walk and wake um, where my ancestors did. You know, being able to walk down to the beach where I know where my ancestors' feet were um, is, is pretty powerful. So that gives me a lot of inspiration. Um, you know, I do a lot of um, 
thinking in my head about the work that I want to make. And then I throw it down on paper or paint or whatever. Uh, my studio is in the house. Um, so I'm able to, uh, you know, be close to my family while I'm working. So um, it's a very inspirational place. So you have a good collection of vinyl behind you too. So that must I, help. I do. Yeah. <laughs> and all my pop cultural <laughs> stuff. I got all these little ships behind me and stuff here. I'm, I'm inspired by a lot of different things. I, I definitely am a pop cultural nerd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Betsy from Vancouver asks, what are some of the artists that inspire you? Some of the artists that inspire me? Well, you know, I, I live, like I said, I'm living back home in the community, so I'm able to see people like my uncle, um, Bill Henderson, and his nephews um, carving up fantastic sculptural works of art through cedar, totem poles, masks, uh, panels, you name it, they're making it. And um, they make they're so prolific like it's it's just awe inspiring to see people like them work so i'm very fortunate to be in the community and around those those people um lawrence paul uwe lipton uh, a friend of mine which i'm very happy to say that he's a friend of mine uh, but also a very big inspiration um, to a lot of my politics and a lot of the work so i think a lot of the the um anger and tenacity that he holds um, is definitely something that I, that I hold on to and pick up and, and run with. So he's definitely an inspiration. Um, yeah. And also people like Dana Claxton and Lori Blondeau and Rebecca Belmore and Brian Young. And, you know, there's so many people out there that inspire me. It's just, it's, it's great. Wonderful. Um, and uh, Greg from Sydney asks, what is your relationship to the work of Emily Carr, and we'll talk about that a little later, but just maybe in a in an immediate way. Yeah, well, I started a body of work called uh, Interventions on the Imaginary in 2014. Um, while I was doing my MFA uh, in Concordia in Montreal, um, where I was really looking at um, the landscape paintings of of the Canadian landscape and seeing how that has influenced the understanding of this colonial construct called Canada. Um, and in particular, I was really drawn to Emily Carr's works uh, because she represented the area that's that my ancestors come from. Um, she painted all up and down the coast, of course, and she stopped um, here in Campbell River and in Cape Mudge were both, uh, both places where my ancestors come from. Um, so I think I have a very um, interesting and close relationship to Emily Carr, even though she's long gone. Um, I see a lot of the works that I did, a lot of the later works that I did with uh, on her paintings as almost uh, posthumous collaborations. I think that she would get a, a kick out of it. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at some of those images in a moment. Uh, Tom from his man cave in East Vancouver asks, <laughs> what's your favorite work, the cereal box series or the Coast Salish light box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a good chuckle about this one earlier. It's, uh, it's like picking your favorite child. Everyone knows you have one, but you're not supposed to say. So I might leave it there, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good answer, Sonny. <laughs> um, Catherine from Vancouver asks, what can Canadians do to better support Indigenous artists? Support local, support authenticity. Make sure that you're buying from an artist um, who is, um, you know, who is Indigenous, who, you know, don't just go pick up a trinket from a tourist shop. Make sure you're buying something that, that's authentic. Um, you know, take a look at the beaters and weavers, um, uh, basket makers, uh, you know, all, you know, Instagram is, is full of inspiration uh, with indigenous artists making some really wonderful things. So, you know, if you can support um, those people, um, the beaters and, you know, just artists in general, indigenous artists in general, to support them by their work um, and understand their work as well. Like a lot of their work has depth and meaning to it. And I think, um, you know, once these, these people are supported and upheld, they'll keep continuing to make really beautiful and wonderful things. Okay. And uh, the final question in this Q&A session comes from uh, another Catherine, also in Vancouver. And she asks, what do you think are the healing impacts of your work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's, 
Ah, that's a tough one. That's a real good one, you know, because I think there's a lot of unpacking that happens with the work that I make, um, the history behind it, the history of my family, the history of this colonial construct. And I think that education um, is probably a really good tool for healing, especially for, um, you know, settler folk. You know, being able to look at this work and understand this work and understand what Indigenous peoples have gone through, um, that it'll allow them, to, it'll allow the viewer to reconcile with the understanding of what this place is and what this place can be. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move back to your work and another piece that is in the Odane Art Museum collection, 1884-1951. Um, this just recently was deinstalled to go back up in probably a year or two. And I can say without question that it was very much a, a popular piece among our visitors here. And can you, again, discuss this combination of a Hudson's Bay blanket and this series of copper cups piled upon it? Yeah, well, this work was made for um, How Soon Is Now, which was an exhibit um, at the Vancouver Art Gallery. So I think the first exhibit I was in at the Vancouver Art Gallery was in 2009, and I was super excited. Kathleen Ritter was the curator, uh, became a, a good friend of mine. Um, I adore her. I adore her work. Um, and, you know, just being able to sit with her in the cafeteria and just talk about the work that I wanted to make because I was making a brand new piece for this exhibit. And um, she had come to the studio a number of times and we talked about things, we talked about potential um, directions. And I just started thinking about um, the disposability um, that our Western consumption culture has. And uh, I just really boiled that down to the ubiquitous coffee cup. Um, it seems, you know, there, you know, the to-go coffee cup, Starbucks, you know, your local indie shop, um, they're all over the place now. And what I found interesting is that I was pairing that idea of the to-go cup with the, how the government treated and still treats Indigenous peoples as disposable. And I wanted to kind of combine those two into this conversation. And so I came up with this idea of making these um, copper grande sized Starbucks cups. Um, and it's, it's funny because I love, I love listening to this work for um, exit when I, when I am able to exhibit this work and, you know, exhibit it at the Odeon and when it's bored for other, for other exhibits as, you know, the size as grande size, not just, you know, a specific dimension, it's grande size. So that always gives me a bit of a chuckle. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about how um, the potlatch ban in Canada, um, lasted from 1884 to 1951. So that's where the title comes from. And I was thinking about um, the copper itself, the materiality of copper and how it is used by a chief and displayed as a, um, what it, it's called a clakwa, um, but it's also called a copper or a shield. Um, it's, it's not a shield in protection, it's just a shield, it's a shape. Um, and it holds the conceptual knowledge and the conceptual wealth of that chief. And it is displayed in such a way that, um, that will, it'll tell the viewer that um, this is the, the record of the potlatch, potlatching that the chief has had. Anyways, um, through the Indian Act and through the potlatch ban, um, it was illegal for um, my ancestors and Indigenous peoples um, to practice their culture uh, up until 1951. Um, and I felt that the government just threw that culture away. And so I paired it up with the coffee cup because we go into a place like Starbucks and we walk in and we could spend anywhere from like five to now eight dollars with a with a cup of hot liquid. Um, and once you've consumed that wealth, the, the vessel that is the cup is no longer relevant to you. So you toss it. Um, and that's where the piling of this cup of, the, of this installation comes into play is that it's one of the kind of have it felt like it was a disposable or disposed of pile of, of cups. Um, the Hudson's Bay blanket itself came in later. Um, uh, in 18 in in 
how soon is now it was just displayed on a on a black low level plinth um but for the show of the equinox gallery we put it on the floor and put it on um uh, hudson's bay blanket one to make sure that people would see it <laughs> um differentiate it from the floor itself um, but also gave it a bit more weight and meaning as well okay and the next work that we'll look at comes from 213 and it's called leela's death yeah, Lila's desk. So this is a piece um, sure. that is that is about my um, grandmother's experience with the Indian day school system. Um, this piece is from 2013, and she passed away um, in 2017, I want to say, uh, maybe 2015. Anyways, she was uh, very thrilled to have this her story um, be told through my artwork. Um, and I made this piece uh, for an exhibit in Ottawa um, that Stephen Loft had curated. Um, and I'm totally blanking on the name of the show right now. It was at the Ryerson Image Center. Anyways, um, I sourced this uh, 1930s era school desk on eBay. I was living in Montreal at the time. I was able to, it was in Montreal. I was able to pick it up there. And I picked up the bar of soap, Life Boy soap uh, from eBay as well. And uh, this is the exact brand of soap that my grandmother remembers. So on her first day of high school, previous to there, previous to then in the early 30s, um, it was uh, under the mandate of the Indian Act. Um, indigenous peoples weren't allowed to go on to um, colonial high school um, without enfranchising. Um, so in contrast to that, my grandfather, who was a little bit older than my grandmother, um, stopped his schooling in grade eight, um, where my grandmother was able to go on to the um, colonial high school in Campbell River here um, after being in day school uh, for the first eight years of her schooling. And she likened that schooling to uh, just being in recess all day long. Uh, she wasn't really taught much of anything. You were really in day school, um, you were taught if you're a man, if you're a boy, you're taught to be a laborer. If you're a girl, a woman, you were taught to be a housewife. Um, but on her first day of high school, she was nervous and excited because she was allowed to finally go to high school and to continue on to grade 12, uh, which is a luxury that a lot of people take for granted nowadays. Um, but she was one of the first Indigenous women to go on to high school. Um, but on her first day, um, and this is the story that she told me, a boy named Peter McFendron left a bar of Life Boy soap on her desk and called her a dirty Indian. And that is the the chuckle that he had at her expense. And it was interesting to hear her tell this story um, to me a number of times. And so, like I said earlier, you know, I was able to learn about this stuff um, through my education, through post-secondary and, you know, uh, talking with community members and other people and bring that, that's those, those questions um, and what I was learning back to my grandmother, my community and have her tell me her own personal story. Um, was interesting and heartbreaking because she told this story um, through a range of emotions. Sometimes it was like, you know, can you believe that guy to like, she'd have a good chuckle about it to she'd get really angry about it. Um, but it was a very, it was a very powerful story. And I wanted to um, honor her with making this artwork um, as a way to explain um, to the viewer and to Canadians that we have a very, um, deep and unknown history that people really need to learn about um, that goes against who we are or who you are as a Canadian. Um, when I first showed this work in 2013 um, in that show at the Ryerson Image Center uh, in Toronto, uh, a, a, a friend of mine's mother was living in Toronto at the time. I went to art school with him and uh, his mother came to the exhibit and we had a good catch up and we talked about the work and I was telling her the story behind the work. And um, they're originally from India. And uh, she just looked at me and goes, I had no clue that this, something like this happened here. Um, she told me that she came to Canada because she believed in all the propaganda that was being told about this, this just and tolerant and welcoming place. But to know this history, um, you know, really changed her perception of what this place was. And I think for me, that's what a lot of my, that some of my work does or what I aim to do with this lot of work is to change the perception of, of what this place is and how we can make it live up to the stereotype that we believe it is. Thank you for sharing that very poignant uh, part of your family history. 
Now we'll move on to a couple of works that reference uh, Emily Carr. And this first one is, what a great spot for a Walmart. <laughs> yeah. So this is on um, an Emily Carr painting, uh, the graveyard entrance um, in Campbell River. So this is actually um, not too far away from me um, where I'm living right now. Um, the uh, uh, totemic work that is behind the um, stylized elements I put on it um, belong to the Quaxista family. Um, and it's currently um, on display at the museum here in Campbell River. Um, the graveyard is probably about a 10, 15 minute walk away from my home, um, right uh, close to that is a, is a strip mall that's been built up um, from the Campbell River First Nation um, with a replica of the um, Thunderbirds um, uh, posts that is there. Anyways, um, what I wanted to talk about with this work um, is I wanted to um, really challenge the perceptions that people have of Emily Carr's work. And I think a lot of people assume that she was um, depicting the dying race. Um, and what I wanted to do with that um, was I wanted to reassert our um, indigeneity uh, onto these works, onto, this, onto these depictions of this kind of colonial landscape, this kind of what looks like to be um, the remnants of a society long gone, um, but it's not long gone. We're still here. I'm still here. Um, the graveyard is still there. Um, it's located on the reserve. Um, but for me, it was just a way to um, reassert our placements uh, on the landscape. And so I kind of took these stylized um, ovoids and placed them onto the um, digital uh, painting or it's the digital scan of the work uh, almost like graffiti to say that we are still here and another reference in the next image uh, entitled yeah shift about to go sideways i'll take you to the amarin you'll like it looks like home of 2016 and we were talking earlier there's a nice sci-fi reference here yeah, so this one, uh, I did a, an exhibit at the Vancouver Art Gallery um, called We Come the Witness, Sunny Asu in dialogue with uh, Emily Carr. Um, and so I was able to expand on my on this series and do some new works um, for the show. Um, and like the previous slides, um, that is, um, I come from both the Canberra River First Nation and the Cape Mudge First Nation, the Weebakai and the Weebakum. Um and the Cape Mudge First Nation is the grand, that my grandfather's um, home village, which is just across the way from me here on Quadra Island. And so this is um, a painting that Emily Carr did of uh, one of my home villages um, before the longhouses were, were uh, taken down. And I paired that up with this um, conversation through sci-fi and through Star Trek, because um, a lot of the works in this series and the later works in this series um, started to take a very sci-fi twist to them. And I started to explore um, the stereotypes um, through sci-fi, particularly in, in Star Trek, um, with the representations of First Nations peoples within these stories. And so this story is um, a specific reference to um, um, the original series uh, with Kirk and Spock and the crew where they come across this planet um, that was inhabited by Native Americans. And it turns out that um, through Star Trek lore, um, there, there was another race of aliens that came along to Earth and removed some Native Americans and brought them over to this planet, um, which was colloquially called um, Amerins. Um, and so I kind of went one step further with that. And uh, I kind of speculated that maybe these aliens had come down and paid us a visit and removed some of these people from um, one of the home villages and brought them to this planet to save them from the, um, the upcoming um, colonial wave. Okay, and now um, we're going to talk about uh, some very recent work, and we'll move right to a piece from 2021 called Mia Moo. Yeah, Mia Moo. So this one is named after my youngest daughter, who is almost three. Um, and if you take a look in the top uh, 
just to the right there, the kind of ovoids with uh, the pink appendages on the top. Um, I was, um, I didn't intend this to happen, but um, I, it turned out to, to work out that way anyways. Um, when I would do my daughter's hair in the morning, I would always create lopsided pigtails no matter how hard I tried her pigtails would all <laughs> always be lopsided so I kind of after I painted these shapes on there it kind of it looked like to me that they were her lopsided pigtails so this is why I called it Miamu. Um, but it is um, this is from my last uh, exhibits in Vancouver called Omnibus which was at the Equinox Gallery um, and I've been working on this series where I've been taking um, comic book pages and uh, breaking their books apart and laying them out on the panel surface and painting over top of them um, to hide and reveal certain elements within the stories. Um, this one takes uh, image pages from um, the X-Men, one of the X-Men comics from the 90s. Um, the series itself is called The Speculator Boom, um, which is in reference to the era in the comic book industry where they were over flooding the market with comic books, special issue this, number one appearance of this guy, get this superhero, get this specific card, whatever it had to be, um, where the industry was flooding the market. So Again, I was pairing with this notion of disposability and the destruction of wealth um, kind of relating to 1884 to 1951, um, where um, chiefs would also break their coppers to signify a shaming um, towards another chief. And famously, um, Bo Dick walked from, uh, uh, from his home in Alert Bay to Victoria, British Columbia, and broke his copper on the steps of the legislature to shame the government for their actions and inactions towards indigenous peoples. And he went one step further and brought that over to Ottawa and broke the copper there as well. Um, so this is my destruction of these comic books uh, was my way of saying, hey, comic book industry, you led me astray when I was a teenager and, and, you know, kind of made, not made me, but, you know, you kind of pushed me in the direction of, of buying all these things saying they'd be super, super, uh, <laughs> sorry, I got tongue tied. They'd be worth a lot of money one day and I'd be able to, you know, use them to, you know, get a nest egg, go to college or whatever, but they're fairly worthless unless they're super high graded. Um, and so I just, I, I've been breaking Tom books, uh, up for the past three years and, and making new work out of them and giving them new meaning and new wealth. I also got hooked on Mad Magazine Super Specials, who were just repeats of old yeah. issues yeah. <laughs> compiled into Super Specials. So yeah. I know the feeling. <laughs> the last work that we're going to talk about uh, this evening, oh yeah, the area's getting real built up for sure. Local Indians are making a killing. Yeah, so this one again is from that Speculator Boom series. Um, this one is on a Batman comic. Um, I can't remember the name. I think it's called Shaman. It's Batman Shaman, I think it is. And um, he does a little side trip to Alaska for some reason. I can't remember the story right now. Um, but, you know, I was a comic book collector when I was a kid uh, up until my late teens and early 20s. Um, but I had since given it up. But I've been recollecting all these issues from my youth. So it's also been a really interesting nostalgia trip to go through these comic books and, and look at the ones that I remember reading as, as uh, a youth and all that kind of stuff. And I remember collecting this one specifically because it was a collector's item. It wasn't because I was drawn to the story. Um, but I just collected it because I was kind of like, Hey, if you collect this, you'll be able to make some money off it someday. Um, but I bought, uh, I've re I've refound these issues in a thrift store and I ended up getting them and it was, yeah, Batman did a side trip to Alaska. And so the first couple of issues um, from this limited run, um, you see him as Bruce Wayne um, arriving in Alaska and interacting with some local indigenous folks. And so you can kind of see in some of these panels, you'll see um, uh, a chief uh, doing a dance for people arriving on a plane. And the title itself is in reference to one of the panels um, where a character is telling um, Bruce Wayne about how the local indigenous peoples are trying to make a killing on all these tourists coming in the town. Wonderful. And thank you so much. It's just been a fascinating discussion of the many elements within your work, both personal and, and larger issues. Um, and I also want to thank Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa for their ongoing support. Thank you to our trustees and founders. Thank you to Susan Roop, who's the patron this year of season three. Thank you to our staff, 
guests and volunteers. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our TNT crew, our director, producer, Justine Nickel, our quality control coordinator, Paige Keith, and thank you to our members and you, the viewer. Uh, I have a shout out. Uh, TNT is dedicated to my parents and Roy Collins from Cornwall, Ontario. Hi to my little sister, Susie, staying up late in Canada, as always. And a thank you to Hannah from the Equinox Gallery, who's been so generous with her time. Any shout outs for you, Sonny? Yeah, you know, I'd be remiss without thanking my family. Um, you know, my, my three kids, Lily, Eli, and Mia, uh, my wife, Sarah, and, uh, you know, my mom. <laughs> All those people <laughs> who have supported me through the years. And, you know, especially, you know, Hannah, Sophie, Andy, everyone at the Equinox Gallery. I've been, you know, I've been very spoiled and lucky to be working with them. Um, I work with the Gallery Art Mirror in Montreal. They've been wonderful as well. And I currently have an exhibit it up in Toronto at the Lucky Contemporary. So, you know, thank you to the O'Danes for supporting me and my work over these years. They've been an early supporter of my work. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really great to see, um, you know, my work in these collections and to be able to talk about it and to be able to thank um, these people for supporting me all these years. So thank you. Okay. Great. Well, next week, uh, we'll be zooming into Montreal in Vicki Alexander's studio. And I just want to say uh, it's been a wonderful conversation, Sonny. And good night from Whistler on the shared territories of the Squamish and Lillibot nations. See you next. See you later. Thank you. Gaila Kessler. Take care.